Hype House for as little as $1 a month. You can support the best Miami Vice podcast on the internet. We promise we won't use the money to find a freezer tube in the Atlantic or fund bowl semen transactions. To see all the benefits of supporting us directly, including early show access or even a free mustache, head on over to patreon.com slash go with the heat. Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week, we're talking about season five, episode three, titled Heart of the Night. Every time in my head, I have to stop myself. And I'm like, is that heat of the night? Heart of the night. <laughs> I kept doing night. it too. Yeah, in fact, I had to scratch a little R in between the <laughs> uh, on my notes. <laughs> it originally premiered on November 18th, 1988. It is written by James Beckett. This is his only episode he wrote and will not be returning. We don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> it is directed by Paul Krasny, who also directed last week's Redemption in Blood. And this is his last one. Oh. <laughs> All right, John. This week's music has a band that Melissa is listening to carefully. She's yeah, you better you better watch yourself. <laughs> <laughs> She remembers what oh, you I said mean, about Morrissey. Yeah, I'm, I'm listening. I know my Robert well, Smith. No, you know, don't you talk bad about Robert I, Smith. I, I, I'm surprised you're such a big Joe Cocker fan, but I do, <laughs> I'm do. i going to do him right. Yeah, you know me. Me and Joe Cocker go way back. Okay, so before we go into the big names of the music, because this is a deep, big music, probably the biggest one of the season so far, uh, let's start out with Dark Truths by Joan Armatrading, and you might remember her from the episode Baby Blues. We talked yeah. about her. She's a three-time Grammy nominee. She had a career spanning 46 years in 19 studio albums. She was born on the Caribbean island of St. Kitts and actually started working at the age of 15 for a tool manufacturer, but lost her job for playing guitar during tea breaks. So you guys probably remember that. So we're not going to spend too much time on that because we've got a lot to cover here. Did a pretty long profile in episode Baby Blues. So we're going to move on. Blood Money by The Church. And they are an Australian psychedelic rock band formed in 1980. Their founding members, Steve Kilby on vocals and bass, Peter Copels and Marty Wilson Piper on guitars, Nick Wool Ward was on drums, for the debut album only, then was replaced by Richard Plug for all of the 80s, followed then by Jay Doggerly and Tim Powers from the 90s on. Their first album produced the radio hit The Unguarded Moment, and they were signed to an Australian, European, and U.S. labels. But their second album, their U.S. label, was dissatisfied and ended up dropping them. Without releasing the album, they would still see success in Australia and in England and were Turn to the charts in 88, the top 40 hit under the Milky Way. The church has found mainstream success that has proven a little elusive, but they've retained a really large international cult following. And, and so, and I mean, even as of 2010, they're continuing the tour. Uh, they're releasing their 25th studio album, uh, Man, Woman, Life, Death infinity it was released in october of 2017 and that's a theme today because i mean we started out with 19 albums they're on their 25th album we're gonna go more in depth on the church when they reappear in the episode asian cut which i believe is episode seven of this season our next song is the one by joe cocker joe cocker also had the song many rivers to cross which appeared in the prodigal son back way back in season one but that was before i was doing my music segment guys <laughs> <laughs> so i feel like we kind of gotta talk about him because I, I can't just throw people back hey go check out that episode that i didn't talk about him he's an english rock and blues singer and musician he's known for his gritty voice and distinct versions of popular songs in 1960 along with three friends he formed the group the cavaliers it would break up a year later and Cocker would leave the band to pursue a career as an apprentice gas fitter while continuing to, to break into music. Joe Cocker, his biography, basically at any point in like the first 10 years of his career, he could have quit at any time and said, F it, I'm going to go be a pipe fitter. You know, this just isn't working out because he goes quite a long time before things actually catch traction. While working as an apprentice gas fitter, 
in, he was then in 61 under the stage name Vance Arnold formed the Vance Arnold and the Avengers. That's when he would first develop his love of the blues and they would mostly play pubs covering Ray Charles and Chuck, Chuck Berry's songs. In 64, get his first record contract as a solo artist and not a member of Vance Arnold and the Avengers. His first release would be a cover of the Beatles song I'll cry instead. But despite extensive promotion, the record would flop, leading Cocker to drop the stage name and form the Joe Cocker Blues Band. There is only one recording from the Joe Cocker Blues Band uh-huh. in existence. <laughs> he would take a one year hiatus from music uh, after that because, yeah, things are out quite well. He would team up after that with Chris uh, Satan to form the Grease Band, which, by the way, guys, I always love the previous band names of people <laughs> that I do in my music segments. The Grease Band is definitely, they're definitely going to be up there. And this is when things start to get fun. Because the Grease Band, but they would catch the, the attention of record producer Denny Cordell. He would bring Cocker and Chuck Cocker in, uh, without the band in and record song, the single Margarine. Cocker and Stanton would actually then dissolve the band, move to London to work with Denny, and then they would bring in a guy named Tommy Iyer on keyboards to make up the new Grease Band. So essentially... They told their old band, like, hey, uh, peace out, guys. Moved to England and just hired a whole new band. (laughs) Cocker would eventually hit the big time of another Beatles song he would cover. He would do a rearrangement of With a Little Help of My Friends that would actually reach number one in the UK in 1968. And it would also later be used as the theme to The Wonder Years. Oh, yeah. Okay. I was like, I recognize the name. I know Joe Cocker, obviously. I recognize the name of the song, but Mm -hmm. I just couldn't place it in my head. Not yet. Like, okay, I know exactly. By the way, that arrangement of that Beatles cover also featured Jimmy Page on lead guitar. Really? Yeah. So this was actually, this really did shoot them into the big time. Denny would be able to get them in and they would play Woodstock in 69. And then directly after Woodstock, Hawker would release. His, and I I emphasize his second album, Joe Cocker. (laughs) Bye bye, Grease Band. Sorry, guys. (laughs) So, and impressed by his cover, McCartney and George Harrison would allow Cocker on his second album to cover two more Beatles songs, Something and She Came Through the Bathroom Window, which would help the album achieve number 11 in the U.S. So he would continue to tour, he would do variety shows like Ed Sullivan, and he would even tour the U.S., but after the U.S. tour, he was tired, he actually dissolved the Grease Band, who who they were actually playing as his backup band. He's like, guys, I don't need you anymore, we're gonna take a break. But after he would dissolve the band, he would be, he would learn that he was contractually obligated to once again tour the U.S., (laughs) So he would quickly form a new band called Mad Dogs and Englishmen with over 20 musicians. And they would tour 48 cities, kind of leaving the old guys in the dust, huh? (laughs) Record a live album, but eventually exhaustion and just personal conflicts would lead to Cocker being depressed. He would drink heavily as the tour wound down in 1970. In 72, they would tour Australia. And then he and six, six of the members would be arrested for pot. And three days later, he would be arrested for assault after a brawl, oh. brawl at their hotel, leading to Australian federal police giving them 48 hours to leave the country. <laughs> after that tour, Staten would retire from music to go start his own label. Uh, Cocker would become an estranged from longtime producer Cordell. He would sink into a depression and for about a year actually used heroin, but kicked the habit basically by trading the needle for the bottle. Just continued down a path of rock star destruction. He would be recording albums 
And actually, in 73, he would record his probably most famous song off the album, I Can Stand a Little Rain, uh, a cover of Billy Preston's You Are So Beautiful, which would hit number five long and number 11 album on U.S. charts. But yeah, just throughout the 70s, just rock star fame and rock star partying. He, he did SNL in 76. And at the time when he did SNL, he was $800,000 in debt to his record mm. label a and mm. But luckily, it, it, he would meet producer Michael Lang, who would only agree to work with him if he sobered up and stayed sober. He would hit the 80s, continue to record and tour sober, but he would see a decline in his popularity, and he would also get into reggae for some reason. <laughs> it just continued success. I mean, he would he would put on the first concerts in the German Democratic Republic and East Berlin. He would play presidential inaugurations like George Bush Sr.'s inauguration. And he was still performing all the way up until 2012. And then, sadly, Cocker died from lung cancer in December of 2014. He was 70 years old, and he had smoked 40 cigarettes a day since since about 1991. So, which obviously can lead to his gritty voice. Yeah, he that took a path on Joe Cocker I didn't know about. Like that whole hard lifestyle that he chose to live. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, so that brings us to the song The Kiss by some band called The Cure. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of the opposite of Joe Cocker and the story that you just told about Joe Cocker, The Cure was the original straight edge. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. So there was this guy, Robert Smith. They released a couple albums. <laughs> That's about it. <laughs> a couple albums. And where emo came from. Think. <laughs> no, okay. So the cure is made up of Robert Smith on guitar and vocals. Uh, or originally was made up of Robert Smith on gu guitar and vocals. Paul Thompson. I have no idea if I'm saying that right. Yeah, that's right. On guitar. Michael Dempsey on bass. Lol Paul Hurst on drums. Uh, they were formed in 1976 and have experienced a number of lineup changes over the years. So bear with me, guys. I'm not going to mention all of them. <laughs> because you just don't get recognized. The, Robert Smith is pretty much the cure. And we're just going to just accept that people change. But Robert <laughs> Smith stays the same. The founding members actually met as friends at Notre Dame Middle School in Crowley, Sussex. Their first performance was literally the end of the year show in 1973. <laughs> By the way, they were named the their band name Obelisk. <laughs> awesome, right? So cool. Don't you just love the pre-famous band names? <laughs> so in 1976, while attending St. Wilfred's Comprehension School, a comprehensive school, they formed a five-piece band, this time called Malice. They would perform <laughs> a bunch of Jimi Hendrix and David Bowie covers. There are only three documented shows, by the way, of the band Malice. So by 77, they were starting to get into punk, you know. I mean, you got to think about it. They were probably, what, seniors in high school in 77, starting to get into punk rock. Lineup changes continued, which also prompted a name change to the band. Obviously, Malice wasn't working out, so <laughs> they went with the band name Easy Cure. <laughs> they also hired and fired, very quickly, a front man known as Gary X. We are unaware of what happened to Gary X afterwards. <laughs> Is he still around? <laughs> we, we, we don't know if Gary X was just a name to protect his identity. They would move on from Gary, after they fired Gary X, and they would hire Peter O'Toole. Not the actor, by the way. <laughs> I was going to say, that would be... <laughs> they would have their first live performance as Easy Cure, and they would enter and win a talent contest, winning a record contract with the German label Areola Hansa. <laughs> O'Toole would then leave the band. This is fantastic. O'Toole would leave the band to go live in a kibbutz. Uh, kibbutz. Kibbutz. By the way, I had to look up what that was, and that is basically the Israeli version of a utopian commune. He joined a cult. He joined the cult, guys. And <laughs> literally a cult in Israel. Like, like the, okay. <laughs> so they would audition 
they would audition for a new band. And I would love to know, I, I haven't read any full on biographies by any of them, but I would love to know if at the audition, if Gary X showed up again, <laughs> like, come on guys, hire me back. <laughs> So, but ultimately, Robert Smith, uh, they wouldn't hire anyone. Robert Smith would just take over on vocals. So they would start recording demos, and they would win another talent contest, winning them another record contract, this time with German label, just, German label, just Hansa. German record labels might be so, better than previous band names. <laughs> <laughs> yes. They never released anything. Part of the reason they never released anything was that the label refused to release their first potential album, which they had named Killing an Arab. <laughs> <laughs> the record label would go, hey, you know, instead, why don't we just do an album with some covers? They said, no, no, we're not doing any cover albums or anything. So in 1978, their contract was dissolved, and they were back to square one. So there's actually nothing. There is never nothing was ever really released of the Easy Cure until later. Bootlegs were made available. They would play their last gig in '78, and the Cure was born once again. The Cure was born through some changes in the band's personnel, and they would start sending out a bunch of demos. And by the end of '78, a guy named Chris Perry, who had just formed his own label called Fiction, he would sign them and release their single, Killing an Arab. But it actually, it blew up. Some people thought it was genius. Other people thought it was the most racist thing. Literally, the band's answer to the cause of them of racism was to put a sticker over the word Arab. <laughs> but it worked. Fiction would release their first debut album, Three Imaginary Boys. Pretty good reviews, you know, aside from the calls of racism. And that would include their second single, Boys Don't Cry. They would do lots of touring. And actually, Robert Smith would be doing double duty during touring, as every night he would perform with The Cure, and then he would fill in as the lead guitarist of... Susie and the Banshees hmm. replacing their their guitarist John John McKay and that he actually continued to play with them and record with them throughout uh, for a long time. So as of their second album, one of the things that happened during their first album was the label didn't think that they were experienced enough, so they brought someone in to kind of oversee everything. So by the second album, Robert Smith wanted more control. They had a couple more lineup changes. There was a side project under the name Cult Hero at the same time. The second album, 17 Seconds, would see more creative control for the band. And it would reach number 20 on UK charts. And it would just con they would continue to be it more build their popularity from there. Third album, Faith, would, see would make number 14. And pretty much after the third album, by about 1983, Pari would start to get worried about some uh, internal issues in the band. So he pitched an idea that they should kind of reinvent themselves. So they had already established their, their, what they're known for, their gothic look and their sound and so they actually kind of did reinvent themselves they went a little bit more pop upish and uh i think at first uh robert smith really had the idea of like well i don't give a crap mostly because he was still recording with the banshees he was still doing stuff with them <laughs> they would continue recording and 1987's double lp kiss me kiss me kiss me would bump would be about the peak of their success or at least their most successful album and song because it would include just like heaven which would be their first top 40 hit in the u.s and help them achieve worldwide success it would move into the 90s continue continuing to hire and fire different band members for different reasons some for <laughs> trashing hotel rooms others for problems with with alcohol but out with the old and with the, they would keep going and actually the 90s was a period of transition in that they they did a lot more commercial stuff they did the song burn for 1994's movie the crow they did dread song which is the theme song for the 95 judge dread with no uh way. sly stallone yeah. no way that, mm -hmm. that they do they, that title yes. song yeah. wow 
Mm-hmm. A bunch of sellouts. Do, uh, <laughs> they would also contribute to the sound checks for movies X Files in '98 and American Psycho in 2000. And pretty much okay. since the 2000s, they've done the greatest hits albums. They've done touring, released other albums. Even though, like every five years, Robert Smith comes out and says, "I think we're, I think the band's almost dead, we're almost done. <laughs> we're never gonna release anything again." Uh, they they played their 40th anniversary show in 2018. They have a new album that's supposed to drop in 2019. Still going. Every single person in the music had careers that spend multiple decades. I have three things that I'll mention about The Cure. One, I didn't realize that Boys Don't Cry was so early. Yeah, it was and, very it was early. Like, their first album is where Boys Don't Cry come from. Okay. Two, as Robert Smith is age, he looks more and more like my grandma every day. Hey. With the crazy hair and the <laughs> <extra> <laughs> thick makeup. <laughs> and three, and I'm going to out Melissa on this. The greatest moment in your musical life is <laughs> going to see them in concert <laughs> when we saw them at the curiosa festival in san francisco yep we were there from like 8 a.m mm-hmm. and they didn't come on until like 10 o'clock at night we yeah saw a whole bunch of other crap bands yep we did <laughs> and then we saw did the, the banshees Cure. perform <laughs> no the banshees were not there <laughs> we saw lots of bands that weren't big yet, oh. that became big later like muse uh-huh. Yes, that was one of them. Yep. Oh. So there, Alyssa, did I do them justice? Yes, you did. I didn't did. talk all kinds of smack. I didn't... <laughs> yeah, I'm so... I, I, I didn't make fun of them. I, I, I did... A- I, I was a lot nicer to them than I was to Morrissey. Yeah, about, exactly. Come on, you have to at least admit that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Poor Morrissey. <laughs> so fragile. <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> Let's go give our final thoughts on this episode, because I feel like there's like a volcano building here where some people <laughs> got to get some stuff off their chest you. <laughs> about this episode. Yeah, Let's go give him. our final thoughts. <laughs> And that's going to do it for us this week on Go With The Heat. We hope you enjoyed this episode. We would love to hear from you. I know I say that every time when we get to the end of the episode. But I'm not playing anymore. We want to hear from you. <laughs> Email us, heat at gmail.com. Get us on Twitter, at Go With The Heat. Get us on Facebook, facebook.com slash Go With The Heat. Instagram, at Go With The Heat. Where else are you going to look for us? You can just yell out into someone's home, Alexa. <laughs> Email go with the heat. <laughs> and Gary F, if you are out there, join me. We will start a band and we will show Robert uh, Robert Smith what he is missing. <laughs> me and you, buddy. Gary X and me. Come on, baby. We're going to rock them. Just a reminder, we do want to hear from you, too, about how we should finish watching this show. Lost episodes before free fall or after free fall as they aired or the order in which they were filmed. Let us know. Email us. Go with the heat at gmail.com. Be sure to check out the website, GoWithTheHeat.com. You can find all the show notes and more. You can also find other ways to support us. Support step number one, email us, GoWithTheHeat at gmail.com. Support step number two, go to your podcast, your platform of choice, and give us five stars. No one ever reads the reviews. Just give us five stars, and then in the review, write your fan fiction about how Gary X would have made The Cure better. Uh, What? (laughs) Yes. Don't write that. (laughs) Yes. We won't read it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> support step number three check out that patreon patreon.com slash go with the heat believe it or not pals miami vice is coming to an end and we have plans for what we want to do for the next show and the future of this podcast go check out that patreon patreon.com slash go with the heat and see the ways that in the direction we want to take the show you want us to do 21 jump street you gotta vote you gotta go out there and vote and let us know if you want us to do 21 jump street alienation i think we're listening something with a wwe wrestler in it we might be able to do that mm-hmm. go to that patreon patreon.com slash go with the heat let us know where you stand that's gonna do it for us this week we hope you enjoyed this episode and we'll see y'all next time bye pal